What? I'm your host, Tom Kearns, and welcome to the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. In this show, I will take you from the end of Roman Britain in 410 to the Norman Conquest in 1066. Along the way, we will meet fascinating characters, such as St. Guthlac, who lived in a grave mound, the Randy King Eadwy, and the ever unready Ethelred. We will grapple with questions like, did Romano-British culture die? Why did Wessex survive and become the Kingdom of England? Did King Alfred really burn those cakes? My vision for this podcast is to share with you, listener, my love for this fascinating period of history. But not just the history. I will also share with you the lives and ideas of the period's most important people. And I will introduce you to the fascinating worlds of Old English and Anglo-Latin literature, where piety meets heroism, and there are a few rude jokes thrown in for good measure. I will strive to bring you up-to-date analysis in an engaging way, so that you too can get out there and bore your friends and family with this arcane knowledge. But really, who said history had to be dull, right? So with all that in mind, let's get started. We will begin back before the Saxons came to Britain, by setting the scene of the world they found when they landed on these shores. And the best place to begin is with an ending. So let's go. Episode 1. The End of Roman Britain. Nearly 400 years of Roman rule in Britain ended between 407 and 410 AD. The written evidence is nearly unanimous in presenting this end as a catastrophic event caused by barbarian, particularly Saxon, incursions. The Greek historian Zosimus, in his New History, relates the final rebellion of the British legions when they proclaimed Constantine III as rightful emperor in 406 to 407. Constantine took a large part, and possibly the last part, of the army in Britain and fought unsuccessfully to establish his control of the empire's western half. The next Zosimus tells us of Britain is that in either 409 or 410, the Britons went into revolt and expelled the Roman magistrates from the island, thus ending Roman government there. Zosimus doesn't say why this happened, but historians have tended to look to an anonymous chronicle written in Gaul in 452, which claims that between 409 and 410, Britain was devastated by Saxon raiders. The expulsion of the magistrates, it is suggested, occurred in response to this raid. This theme of raiding and rebellion was later adapted by the British monk Gildas in his work on the ruin and conquest of Britain into a grand theory of early British history, in which raiding and conquest were divine punishment for the Britons' constant inconstancy and sinfulness. I will say more on Gildas in a later episode. He's such a major source that it's essential to give him his due time, but for now it's important to note that he, following trends found in earlier sources, presented a slash and burn end to Roman Britain, an end of blood, death, fire and large-scale displacement of people. For a long time, this narrative of destruction by Saxon invaders influenced all writing on the end of Roman Britain. The archaeological evidence was often interpreted in line with the narrative that Roman Britain died as the Saxons spread. The ruins of Roman towns and the graves of Romano-Britons themselves were taken as hard proof that the written evidence accurately reflected reality. However, the general trend in scholarship in the past few decades has been to point out that despite how it appears at first glance, the archaeological evidence actually does not support the idea that Roman Britain ended due to Saxon invasion. Archaeologists have now realised that there is a chronological dislocation between the end of Roman life and the arrival of the Saxons. In other words, Roman Britain was already mostly dead when Saxons began to settle in large numbers. The generally accepted view now is that the end of Roman Britain didn't come suddenly. Rather, its decline played out over at least several decades. If we were to pick a date when the terminal decline began, we could do much worse than 383, when the military governor of the province, Magnus Maximus, raised his banner as usurp emperor and left for Gaul. He took with him a large chunk of the troops stationed in Britain, and set up an ultimately doomed rebel empire at Trier. Britain's military strength never fully recovered from this, and most of those who left with Magnus never returned. While 383 is a useful start date for Roman Britain's terminal decline, symptoms of economic crisis and military unrest begin to appear as early as the 350s, 
Around that time, the quality and quantity of pottery in Romano British towns begins to seriously decline. Historian Brian Ward Perkins has argued that the finely crafted ceramics that occur across the Roman Empire can be used as a barometer of Roman civilization. He argued that a decline in quality and quantity and uniformity, like that found in Roman Britain, suggests a collapse of the kind of comfortable urban life that the Romans exported all over the Mediterranean world. That these signs of decline become visible in Britain around 350 suggests that decline began several decades before Magnus's revolt, although the revolt could still be seen as the point at which this decline became terminal, since certainly Britain never fully recovered from it. If you asked, what caused the end of Roman Britain? Tom, I'm in a hurry, so please just sum it up. I'd respond by telling you that the end of Roman Britain was primarily caused by a conjunction of three things. Civil war, barbarian raiding, and a ballooning cost of defence. None of these things can be easily separated from the others, and in fact they form a kind of spiral. The civil wars, like that started by Magnus, weakened the military presence in Britain. This weakness was exploited by barbarian raiders, which then required increased spending to rebuild and expand defences. When tax collectors couldn't raise enough money, and barbarians continued to attack, then it increased the disgruntlement of the army, which would then explode into more civil wars, and so on and so on. Robin Fleming points out that the burden this placed on a British economy that was seemingly already in decline probably proved fatal. The archaeological record supports this. In the 380s, around the time of Magnus's revolt, the fine country villas of Roman Britain began to fall into disrepair, with spaces previously set aside for luxury being co-opted for more practical purposes, such as drying the harvest. Not long after this, around the 390s, towns like Canterbury, York and London began to be abandoned. Archaeological layers from around the end of the 4th century yield up so-called dark earth, which is largely empty of the kind of everyday objects that we usually find in digs at Roman towns. In places like York, this dark earth also offers up evidence that nature had begun to reclaim the towns, since we also find traces of insects and small mammals found mainly in uncultivated wetlands, now spreading into towns. The depopulation of towns didn't occur everywhere at once, though. Some places in the west of Britain, such as Bath and Cirencester, continued to maintain roads and public places into the early 400s, suggesting that town governments still existed. But even these settlements eventually fell into ruin, and none of them lived into the mid-5th century. But where did the people go? At around the time that towns were being abandoned, in the west and the north, ancient hill forts and abandoned fortifications, such as those along Hadrian's Wall, were being reoccupied. Not much is known about the people who moved in or why, but the prevailing assumption is that they were looking for places that were more easily defensible than the towns had been. The vulnerability of towns was, to some extent, intentional. The different administrative regions of Roman Britain, which broadly followed pre-Roman tribal divisions, each had a central town. In the east and south, these often were built upon pre-existing tribal communities, but for the more rugged terrain of the west and north, old forts were abandoned in favour of less easily defensible locations. The idea was that should a group go into revolt and seize a town, it would be easier for the army to retake it and pacify the region. The end first of isolated villas, then of difficult to defend towns, and then finally the reoccupation of old forts, might indicate that violence began to increase from the 380s on, and people seeking security chose to upend their lives by entirely relocating. It may be consistent with Gildas's comment that the Britons fled into the mountains to escape the Saxons. While the abandonment of towns wasn't caused by Saxons, the idea presented by Gildas may not be otherwise that far from the truth. It has also been suggested that this move reflects the rise of a new military elite among the Britons, a sanitised way of saying warlords, but I'll say more on this in the next episode. All this suggests that while Roman Britain may not have ended in fire and bloodshed, its end was nevertheless traumatic. In fact, it would seem that the end of Roman Britain saw the single greatest change in people's daily lives in British history. Urban life has survived through a lot in Britain, through invasions, blitz, strikes, Brexit, Covid, but it didn't survive the tumult of the late 4th century. At least, that's one interpretation of the evidence. Just as there are those who use the evidence to argue for a significant collapse in the Roman way of life, albeit not one brought about by the Saxons, there are others who emphasise continuity and focus on signs of adaptation. 
Perhaps the most famous example of this is to be found in the ruins at Roxeter in Shropshire. Archaeological evidence here suggests continued occupation into the 7th century, with signs of building around former public baths. True, this building was in wood rather than in stone, since widespread use of stone as a building material vanished in the 5th century. But the evidence is nevertheless compelling. Use of wood as a building material could also account for some of the dark earth layers in other towns, since use of such a perishable material wouldn't leave much archaeological trace. With Roxeter in mind, some have argued for a late antique period in Britain, which would make the transition into the early Middle Ages potentially less traumatic. Late antiquity as a distinct period, not classical but also not medieval, is associated particularly with the work of Peter Brown and his classic study, The World of Late Antiquity. Thus far, discussion of the late antique world has often been limited to the Mediterranean, meaning that Britain tends to be excluded. But the evidence at Roxeter, combined with evidence from elsewhere in Western Britain for continued occupation of urban sites, has raised the idea that developments in Britain may be similar to those seen elsewhere in the late antique world. In particular, the end of villa culture elsewhere coincided with the elite migrating to towns for greater security. If something similar happened in Britain, combined with greater use of wood in construction, then there could have been more continuity in civic life than is immediately obvious. But this is speculative, and Roxeter remains an anomaly. The evidence as it stands suggests a profound change over the span of a few decades. Economic collapse, the abandonment of urban life and a relocation to renovated military structures in the West, it must have been a shocking change even if it wasn't accompanied by barbarian invasion. That did come as the Irish, Picts and Saxons exploited the weakness of the province, but the most significant changes had already occurred by then. But as disastrous as the material collapse of Roman Britain seems in hindsight, it is not clear that the people living through this period knew that it was the end of Roman Britain. On the contrary, they fully expected the legions to return. They continued to identify as Roman, they continued to trade with and communicate with the wider Roman world. The Britons had been irreversibly changed by 400 years of Roman rule, and the successor kingdoms that emerged from the ruins of Roman Britain owed a complicated debt to Rome. They technically were not Roman, but they weren't post-Roman either. Instead, they were sub-Roman. But that will be the focus of the next episode. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this first episode of the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. I'm fairly new to podcasting, so there are still some kinks that I'm trying to iron out. I hope your interest has been piqued, though, and that you'll come back for the next episode, Sub-Roman Britain. You can find a bibliography for this and future episodes on the show's website, the link for which you can find in the show notes. I look forward to seeing you again next time. And once again, I'm your host, Tom Kearns. This has been the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. Thank you for listening.